Thank you. Thank you so much. How are you? Good. Did you enjoy the presentations up to now? Yes. Yeah, me too. So many amazing topics in uh, TED speeches up to, up to now in out around the world, right? So many interesting people trying to reach out to us, share, communicate their ideas. But the basic question is, and the main question I want to address with you today is, what is the main purpose of communication? And by this, I simply mean, why do we communicate? Why do we talk to each other? Why do we send so many messages through our mobile devices every day? Why do parents talk to kids? Why do teachers talk to students? Institutions do it as well. Why do governments talk to their citizens? And why do uh, companies talk to their employees, brands to their customers? The whole point is that we are in a crossroad. And in this crossroad, we have to make a choice. For 20 years now, I'm trying to find the answers to these questions. What I found up to now is that if we are to consider communication in its true form, we have to change the model that we are using. And the new model we need to adopt is a brain-based model. By this I mean that we need to take the inner workings of our brain into account when we, before, during, and after a conversation, not only what happens during the conversation. That's not the whole story. Now, we didn't know this for a very long time, but I have to say, no more. No more. Look at the world around you. Do you like what you see? Do you think that the current communication model works? If it worked, it would be a much better place. So we need to go to this change. And we have a choice to make. And the choice is the following. Either we will start understanding the brain better and adapt this new style of communication that will make us more effective and efficient in what we're trying to say, or we will continue using the old communications model and continue having the misunderstandings, confusions, and illusions that we have been doing up to now. I can summarize best the problems of this old communication model by a very interesting statement by Bernard Shaw. Bernard Shaw said, that the single most important problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I will leave a little bit this to sink in. He didn't say one problem of communication. He didn't say the fifth problem of communication. He said the single most important problem of communication is the illusion that it has taken place. In my experience, I understood that this illusion comes from the moment of our expectation about our communications. So the key question for me is, when we communicate, what do we expect? If we expect to achieve shared meaning, common understanding, agreement in some comments, uh, concepts that we discuss about, then we will have a problem. And we will have the illusion that Bernard Shaw was talking about. But if communication is not about shared meaning or common understanding, then what is it about? This is a very simple question, but the answer has changed my life, and I hope it will change yours. We currently live in a tyranny, the tyranny of the current communications model. It's a regime, and as with every regime, it creates more problems than the one that it solves. What is this tyranny of the communication model? We have singled out one specific part of our brain, the thinking, rational, more executive part of our brain, and having at the top of the priority in our communication list. So when we communicate, we actually target the thinking of the person we talk to. Should be this the case? And you see, parents, teachers, managers, governments, when they talk, to their counterparts. They try to change their thinking. They try to share some meaning or to achieve some understanding. But does this work? Well, it doesn't work because it is based on a now outdated model of human nature. This old communication model. It's actually based in a view of human nature which we now call Homo economicus. Homo economicus is based on 18th century classical economics thinking. In a very simple world, with very limited information, very limited choices, very limited understanding about the brain, and an overconfidence, I would say, about rational thinking and hard science, 
we developed a model of human decision which says the following. Every human being is capable, or should be capable, in taking the right decision by ma making a cost-benefit analysis and optimize the choices that we make. If we are not performing this rational thinking and, and optimizing our decision-making, then we are kind of stupid. And we have to modernize the human being to put it into the small box of rationality and thinking. Now, the homo economicus model was always scientifically wrong. But maybe it fitted a, simple, a simpler world than the one that we live today. But if you compare our world today with the world of 300 years ago, you will see that it's completely different. So we need to change the models. And this change of models asks us to move from the top of priority in our communication list, understanding, and replace it with behavior. We need to start looking at communication in a more holistic way, and not just thinking. Because at the end of the day, as human beings, we have gut feelings, we have emotions, we have impulses, and of course we have thinking. But singling out thinking, it's a very, I would say, even lazy approach to understanding human nature. So we need to take a much more holistic, inclusive, and I would say, effective way of communication. So, communication is about behavior, and it's not about understanding. This was very shocking when I, I realized the simple truth. But it changed everything. But you might ask me, come on, Nikos, what are you talking about? Doesn't that thinking comes first? So you have to think something, decide, and then behave? Shouldn't it work like that? Of course it could work like that. If you were a homo economicus. Any homo economicus here? maybe a professor of economics in the back, I think, you know, raising his hands. So that's the whole point. Thinking is not necessary for a behavior. Actually, thinking is many times an afterthought, and the behavior comes first. And I will give you, I will share with you some examples of, in order to, to illustrate better what I'm trying to say. How many of you have kids? Yeah, a few. So kids at around three and a half to four years old, they understand, they have the ability to understand socializing and the importance of social relations. So you talk to your kid and you say, are you going to share this toy with your friends when they come home? Yes, of course, I'm going to share my toy. Um, do you like when other kids do not share the, the toys with you? No, I don't like that at all. So you want to be friends with our kids, so you will share your toys. Yes, of course, I will share my toys. And then these friends come at home, your kid doesn't share the toy, and the war, you know, erupts. Um, also, a teenager talking to his parents. He fully shares the worries of his parents concerning a trip abroad, school trip abroad. He understands that he should not wander off in dangerous areas. Sure enough, when, they, when he visits this uh, place abroad, and with a little bit of peer pressure, he wanders off to these dangerous, but to his mind, very intriguing places. Employees, a manager comes to a department and says, come on, guys, this week, this month, we have to give 110% of our performance. This is very important for our bottom line. This is very important for our department. Let's do it. Everybody says, let's do it, agrees, shakes hands, nods, and then the month comes and nobody or very few people increase their, their behavior, their performance. And last but not least, in an area of expertise I've been dealing for, for a long time, you invite customers in a focus group. I don't know if you ever participated in any focus group. So you invite consumers in a focus group, and, and you demonstrate a new product. And consumers fully understand and fully grasp, fully grasp the, the, the new features of this product compared with the old one. They're actually enthusiastic. They say, yeah, if this product hits the market, I will go and buy it. And then when the product hits the market, nobody buys it, and it flops. So you see, understanding and behavior are two different things. So parents, Managers, marketeers, in these cases that example, they all agreed, understood each other, shared meaning. They had common understanding. But was this the whole story? When they went out in their real life, then chaos erupted, and of course the actual behavior took place, which was not the intended behavior. So is it job well done for these people when we discuss and analyze and we're in a room and we have to agree? If we have this kind of interaction, even with a very transparent, direct, sophisticated feedback mechanisms, 
Can we be satisfied that we achieved communication without taking into account behavior afterwards? Well, I think not, because communication cannot be considered as successful at the point of information exchange. If you consider it successful in the, moment, uh, in the moment of information exchange, we are running the risk of what Bernard Shaw said, having the illusion that we succeeded with our communication and leaving the room very happy. Okay. So, if it is not about information exchange, it's about behaving accordingly. And I believe that this is what Bernard Shaw tried to say. The illusion of communication is the illusion of understanding. However, behavior has to be taken into account. And this illusion is causing a lot of pain, both personally and collectively. How many crying kids and disappointed parents? How many unmet organizational goals? How many broken hearts and broken relationships? How many wasted advertising campaigns and products that hit the market and flop? All these all these symptoms are actually symptoms of the old communications model, which cause us to waste a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of money. Okay. So we are changing this. We're actually living in a revolution of the brain, where, of course, it's a work in progress. Daily, we learn more about the brain. But maybe you have heard some of these new terms, like neuromarketing. And my, my friends and colleagues in Sales Brain US, a pioneering market, marketing, neuromarketing agency, they have, they have worked with 100,000 executives around the world, or neural leadership. And my, my, my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Alexandros Psychogios, we're actually co-authoring at the moment a book on applied neuroscience for leaders. Very exciting topics. Neuropolitics, neuroeconomics, neuroeducation, neurodesign. As I said, there is a lot of work in progress here, but all these people, professionals dealing with this, we all have something in common. The fact that we cannot ignore the brain when we design our, our activities or our communications, because thinking does not drive behavior. In the bottom line, thinking does not drive behavior. We cannot single out a specific part of the brain, what we call the executive part of the brain, the, the frontal lobe the, in the, on the neocortex, that does just one job, the thinking, the analysis, and consider this as the highest purpose of communication. Okay. Thinking is important. I would say it's even necessary. Okay. But alone cannot do anything. So, how to? I would like to give you some few um, uh, points that uh, I hope that they will help you, help you to come up to speed with brain-based communications. First of all, we have to dethrone thinking. We have to change our mindset on concerning communications and start considering the whole approach, which is, of course, including behavior. Second, we have to share emotions. When you are, you are discussing with somebody, instead of thinking of sharing a concept of transmitting an idea, why don't you think of transmitting an emotion? First of all, it will make the conversation more, more memorable, and second, it will drive behavior faster. Third, consider people's habits. You might agree something with someone, but habits are very strong and they don't change so easily. Fourth, consider your biases, both your, your own biases and the biases of, with the people that you talk to. Your thinking is not as clear as, as we would like it to be. We have all these shortcuts, like stereotypes, that influence our thinking. We have to be aware of this. We have to scan and use the environment. Our brain has evolved over millions of years to interact with the natural environment and the physical environment around us. When we communicate, do we consider this physical environment and how it interplays with our communication? Six, we have to make it easy. We might give a very clear direction to somebody to do something. But then maybe our procedures, our rules, our processes might be making actually very difficult, might be putting barriers for them to do what we have mutually intended to do. Seven, we have to abandon common sense. Many times when we create messages in a common sense way, these messages have exactly the opposite effect than the one that we have initially wanted to do. So be very careful of common sense, because which part of the, crea of the brain creates common sense? Okay, the executive part. And eight, we have to speak with actions. The oldest parts of the brain, the ones that sit below the neocortex, are actually the ones that drive behavior. And guess what? These parts of the brain cannot speak. Because the language skills of the brain is on our neocortex, on our new brain. So we might be doing a lot of talking, but the real parts of the brain that drive behavior cannot understand any anything from this talking. So better to speak with actions. So what's next? I believe that we have to do two things. First of all, to change the mindset. 
We need urgently to re-educate, retrain from parents to teachers, university professors, people that run businesses, institutions, organizations, in order to get rid of this tyranny of the old model. Second, I think that technology will help us to become better in brain-based communications. Imagine that you're wearing smart glasses that have the ability to decode in real time the facial expressions of the people you talk with and then show you what are their feelings are, what are their emotions are. Of course, they have to wear the same. Eh? <laughs> Even more scary, imagine that you're in one part of the world with some electrodes on your brain transmitting raw emotions to your loved ones in another part of the planet. Eh? Or images. Okay, all these are not science fiction, they're happening now. If I had to choose two possible outcomes from my speech today, the first, you fully understood what I talked about, your, your rational part of the brain is very happy and has a clear, clear view of all the concepts that were involved, but you did nothing about it. Or second, you didn't give much thought of what I talked today, but tomorrow you maybe talked about this with your friends, searched a little bit about the topic, changed the way that you post information online, and most importantly, you started considering behavior as an integral part of the communication process, then of course I would choose the latter. Because only then we have achieved something, and we have achieved this together. Only then we communicated. Thank you so much. Thank you.